nearly 690 million people worldwide are undernourished. That's about 9% of people on Earth that don't get the right food or enough of it. But at the same time, growing and producing food is among the biggest contributors to climate change. So how do we feed our planet without harming it? One idea, distributed renewable energy. Solar-powered mini-grids like this one can bring reliable power right into the fields. In Ethiopia and Kenya, the sun powers irrigation. In some of these cases, solar water pumps tripled the crop yield. Distributed renewable energy is one way to take the pressure off the environment while giving smallholder farmers the power they need to feed our planet. Hello and welcome to Washington Post Live. My name is Laura Riley and I'm the business of food reporter for the Washington Post. And today I have the great pleasure to speak with two experts in American farming, uh, former secretaries of agriculture, Tom Vilsack and Mike Johans. Gentlemen, thank you both so much for, for participating in this today. And up, oh, it looks like Tom Vilsack has a little bit of a connectivity problem. Let's hope we can kind of get him back here. So Secretary Johans, I'll start with you and I'll ask you the question that I was going to ask Secretary Vilsack first. Um, in the pandemic, we've seen that um, American farmers are incredibly vulnerable. Um, it was reported this week that 40% of American farm income this year will come from federal monies, bailout monies, trade war, et cetera, et cetera. And yet American farmers are going bankrupt at a higher rate than in the past. Can you speak a little bit to what has gone wrong in the system? Secretary Johan, can, you, can you hear me? Now I can hear you, yes. Yay, yay, wonderful. So shall, shall I repeat the question? You didn't hear my question. I did not, I'm sorry. Oh, oh no worries at all. So I was going to ask uh, Secretary Vilsack first, but I, I'll ask you this question and hope he'll get back on with us in a moment. Um, the pandemic has really revealed the vulnerabilities of American farmers. And for instance, uh, this, this week it was reported that 40% of farm income for the year will come from federal assistance programs of one sort or another. So how how have we gone so far off the rails uh, and and what do we need to do to get back? I know that's not a not a small question at all. No, it's a great question though. I mean, it really gets to the heart of what's going on in our food system. The first thing to recognize, very important point is that uh, production worked during the pandemic. There's plenty of food, there always was. Now. Getting it from point A to point B was often a challenge and processing it, et cetera. But the American farmer rancher delivered. Um, the food was available. But you point out a very, very difficult issue for the American farmer, and that is um, too much of their income is coming from the government. And they don't like that. And I don't blame them because uh, it's a bad, bad problem for the future and for the present. So how do you solve that problem? You really got to get markets working again. You've, 
just got to focus in a laser sort of way on trade issues that have been a huge stumbling block over the last few years. Uh, a good example is China started buying corn and soybeans. Well, all of a sudden we saw a lift in the prices for corn and soybeans. Add to that some difficult weather throughout the Midwest. And again, you saw better prices than we have seen for a while. But again, it's important to, to emphasize that production piece of our food system worked and continues to work. In a related uh, subject, um, the, age, the average age of American farmers has really uh, risen quite precipitously in, in recent years. And a lot of times farms are not being handed down uh, to the next generation of that same family. What do we need to do to um, incentivize young farmers and perhaps um, financially support young farmers. And, and uh, Secretary Johans, I'll, I'll, I'll start with you on that. You know, I traveled all over the country. I'm sure Tom Vilksack can, can share stories just like the one I'm going to share. I was doing a Farm Bill Forum, uh, we called them, and a young man from uh, FFA got up and he said, you know, Mr. Secretary, it's very simple bring profitability back to agriculture and uh, we'll stay home. We want to stay home. We want to farm. We want to ranch. And I think that's a very valid point. The, the average age of the American farmer is uh, late 50s, early 60s. You can see that we're in for a huge change here. Uh, technology will solve some of those problems, but one of the challenges with, with that is that fewer of those young people will stay home and we really need that. We need them to stay back on the farm or the ranch to help our build our communities, our small towns across America. Or can Wonderful. I and project in this? Absolutely. It's so good to have you here. Yeah. I hope our connectivity yeah, sorry. holds. Sorry, sorry about that. Uh, let, let me try to respond to both questions that Mike has done a great job of responding to. First of all, he's absolutely right about markets. And I would just add to what he has talked about in terms of trade making sure that we also create new market opportunities for farmers. I think that the issue with climate gives us an opportunity to, to essentially uh, pay farmers for sequestering carbon, uh, opening up a, a whole series of ecosystem market opportunities that will pay farmers uh, additional income. I think it's also an opportunity for us to transform agricultural waste into a variety of new products uh, so that they now have an ingredient that they can sell and an additional commodity, if you will, that they can sell. So it is additional markets. And in terms of uh, a young farmers getting them into business. Mike's absolutely right. You've got to have a profitable system, but you also have to have access to credit. Uh, you have to and make it available and affordable for young people to get started, uh, providing them some uh, a break on risk management tools so that they they can weather that first difficult storm. I mean, if you were a farmer in Iowa and the derecho went through your your crop the first your first year on the job, so to speak, it would be devastating. So it's really important for us to make sure that we have the kind of infrastructure support from capital and risk management to supplement uh, additional market opportunities to give those beginning farmers uh, an opportunity to get started. Wonderful. I want to go back to something you just said in terms of carbon sequestration. Um, are, are you an advocate, uh, Secretary Vilsack, of carbon credits or, or some kind of system? And, and how would there be kind of a third party audit on kind of the, the efficacy or the efficiency of, of farmers going down that path? We're getting much better at certifying and quantifying and measuring the results of certain conservation practices. And as we get better at it, it's going to be you, you will be able to then market uh, those results. It may be a corporation that wants to offset some regulatory responsibility that they have. It may be an entity that wants to do it for, for uh, the ability to market itself as a sustainable company. But the reality is more and more consumers, more and more companies are interested in where their food comes from and how it's being sustainably produced. Farmers are in a position to provide help and assistance, but they shouldn't be asked to foot the bill for this. This is, I think, something where farmers can be incented to do the right thing. Uh, they are already doing a lot of this, but they, they can do more. And, and I think if we set up the right structure, the right financial support system, you're going to see American agriculture gravitate towards this and embrace it in a very significant way. Wonderful. So, Secretary Johans, you and I spoke briefly yesterday um, about and if regardless of what happens November 3rd, um, we need to have a different approach to um, 
our trade partners, uh, that they're, they're, that far, American farmers have really borne the brunt of, of some of these decisions in, in recent years. What precisely needs to happen um, in terms of our agreements with trade partners to maximize um, you know, profits for, for American farmers? A whole host of things, but one of the things that uh, you find out very, very quickly is that uh, our trade partners want reliability. They, if they're going to rely upon the United States for food, they need to know that that market is going to be open to them, that uh, disputes will be solved in a fair, expeditious sort of way. And uh, uh, so that is a, just a key issue is uh, the re reliability piece of this. The second thing I would point out is that we're in world competition. Uh, about 25% of our ag production uh, value-wise uh, is exported. We need these foreign markets. If we don't fill those uh, orders in China or other parts of the world, someone else will. Uh, so doing everything we can to make sure that our agriculture is at the cutting edge is extremely important. It's always been important, but it's especially important now. Uh, if I might just add uh, one comment on, on what Tom said about looking for other sources of revenue for farmers, he could not be more right. Um, you know, when I was governor of Nebraska, I would look to the east with some degree of envy at Iowa, where he was governor. and they were developing solar energy or uh, wind energy opportunities all across Iowa, which provides additional income. So we have to think create creatively here, think outside the box. Uh, farmers do need additional sources of income. We definitely need the traditional, the foreign markets, the uh, markets here in the United States, but we, we absolutely have to look at other alternatives to bring income to agriculture. So back to you, uh, Secretary Johans. Um, obviously, uh, if, if, if China is going to grow its swine herd, there's an opportunity to sell them corn and soy. And I would love to get your thoughts on kind of how to expedite that. But also, why haven't we sold more pork to China this past year, even with their kind of commitments to us in terms of, of trade. Uh, what, what have been the impediments there? Well, it's been a, a, a difficult relationship, a complicated relationship with China, especially over the last few years. And I can tell you, as Secretary, I, I felt for a long time that something was going to come to a head with China. Um, the trade relationship was not working very well. But again, uh, that's a very important marketplace to us. And you're 100% right. Your question, it's the nail on the head. They need protein. They lost 50% uh, or more of their swine herd. Uh, so they desperately need por uh, protein in the short term. Uh, you know, beef, uh, poultry, pork. Uh, but they're also rebuilding that, uh, that herd. And so you're going to see them working to rebuild the swine herd, poultry, et cetera. Again, because their future needs call for more protein. That's where we come in, I hope. We need to do everything we can to stabilize that relationship, really intensely work on that relationship and build that open channel to sell our products into China and other parts of the world. But focusing on China, it's a great market for corn and soybeans. We've seen that especially recently. Uh, whether they'll meet that first year commitment has been a, a big debate. Uh, but when you see the needs of their people and the need to rebuild their ag sector, uh, very definitely we can be a key player in that. And that will benefit the American farmer and rancher. Wonderful. So, Secretary Spilsack, I know dairy is, is near and dear to your heart. Uh, and at the beginning of the pandemic, we saw dairy being dumped, eggs being dumped, even as we saw grocery store shelves empty. So I'd like to hear two things from you. One, just kind of where did those supply chains bottleneck or break down? And then also kind of what did we learn about resiliency through through the past seven months? Well, I think one of the things that we learned is that our system is, in fact, resilient uh, and that all things considered made a fairly uh, good pivot. Uh, when 50% of the food that normally goes into 
uh, into the marketplace through food service that was disrupted dr dramatically and immediately. Uh, it made it uh, a little bit difficult to transition from going into food service into humanitarian food bank assistance. Uh, frankly, there was a disincentive, and there still is a disincentive in the system for folks to donate to food banks. In order to get a, a gallon of milk uh, to a food bank, uh, it would take about $1.50 of additional processing uh, per gallon to do that. Well, it's very difficult to ask farmers and processors that are already losing money because of the disruption to lose even more money so that they're in the position to be able to donate. So we've got to figure this out. We've got to figure out a way in which we can compensate uh, producers uh, for that cost so that there is not a disincentive uh, for donation so that we can pivot more quickly and more effectively. The second thing we need to do is to make sure that in our production process, our workers are protected because we not only saw a disruption on the uh, on the disincentive side, but we also saw uh, a rather significant uh, impact of the virus in many of the processing facilities, which disrupted the supply chain as well. And so I think those are two very important lessons. Uh, one, creating a system that eliminates the disincentive, disincentive and two, preparing uh, our workforce in a much better way to be protected during uh, the next pandemic. Wonderful. Before I move on to the next question, I'd like to just ask you one more thing in, in that area. Can you speak to uh, the role of local and regional food systems as a uh, as a, an additional tool in kind of our resiliency toolbox? You know, I think one of the things we've learned is the supply chains need to be shortened. Uh, you know, on the processing side, for example, it, it may be uh, it, it, we need to sacrifice a bit of profitability, at least initially, for greater resilience. And that means basically having perhaps more but smaller processing facilities scattered throughout uh, uh, the Midwest, scattered throughout the country, uh, so that we are in a position to, to be able to process if there's a disruption at one plant, it doesn't completely shut the process down. Secondly, creating local and regional markets creates an opportunity, I think, for us not to be as dependent, if you will, on commodity-based sales. It gives an alternative. Uh, it gives a, a, an, a, an alternative market, and it pr frankly provides farmers the ability uh, to be able to negotiate their own price as opposed to being uh, required to, to be able uh, to take the, the global price that's dictated by the, by the market. Um, having a local market allows you to do business with your local school district or your local hospital or any other institutional purchaser of food. So it creates greater resiliency. It creates redundancy in the system, uh, and I think that's one of the things that we're learning here. I think as people go to grow to appreciate our food system and the farmers who produce all of this food, uh, I think there will be efforts to try to make sure that our system is much more resilient for future disruptions. Wonderful. So, Secretary Johans, do you have anything to add to to that? Or yeah, uh, Tom's comments are great comments. Uh, I'd offer a couple thoughts on that. Uh, probably 10 locations process uh, 50, 60 percent of our beef, and I could say the same thing about uh, other proteins. So you can see how a disruption in just one plant, which is what we saw with COVID, um, you know, sick workers, and all of a sudden uh, we're in trouble. And uh, there's no place to, to sell the pigs because the processing plant is backed up and and, and struggling to keep lines running. So uh, Tom's comments are, are well taken. Uh, we would be uh, well served if we could expand uh, the opportunities for food processing. Over time, we've just built this remarkably efficient system, but in a pandemic, if there's a hiccup, it's, uh, it can have serious consequences. So Anything we can do to incentivize uh, additional uh, processing opportunities across the country, especially in areas like the Midwest or uh, large states that are cattle producers or poultry producers, whatever, I think would be a huge benefit in terms of a, a, a food system that can deliver during times of crisis. Wonderful. So I'd like to ask each of you a little bit about uh, your thoughts on, on the adequacy of our nutrition assistance programs. Um, so obviously we have SNAP, WIC, we have Pandemic EBT, we have the Farmers to Families Food Box program, um, each obviously having a slightly different um, audience. Uh, but I would like to kind of speak to you both about whether they have met the needs in this incredibly trying time and what needs to happen for each of those programs moving forward. And, and Secretary Vilsack, why don't you start? 
Well, I, I, you know, I think if people understood how the SNAP benefit is calculated, they would have to be scratching their head. Uh, it's based on uh, an antiquated uh, calculation, which I think results in a, in a fairly significant low benefit, if you will, to families that are you know, struggling uh, financially. Uh, and so one thing I think we need to take a look at in the long term is how we calculate the SNAP benefit. Uh, in terms of WIC, one of the concerns that I have is that uh, too few people take a full advantage of a very good program. Uh, and Mike may, may realize this as well. Uh, the reality is this is a good program. It, it obviously helps women, infants, and children. Uh, but only 50 to 60 percent of the people who are eligible take full advantage of that program. And so I think we need to do a better job of making sure folks understand the benefit of that program and the availability and don't see it as welfare, but see it as, as a way of, of providing uh, adequate nutrition. Uh, to their families. Uh, in terms of the the, the box program, uh, look, uh, you know, you got to try things in, in a difficult time. But one of the things I think we need to learn in the future is making sure that as we do uh, whatever the government does, whatever, however it intervenes, uh, that we do it in a way that doesn't completely disrupt uh, market forces. Uh, and I know that's a delicate balance. Uh, if you buy too much of this or buy too much of that, you can really create a spike. Uh, in the price and make it sometimes more difficult to, to be able to export or sell that product as well overseas. So you basically disrupt uh, one of your key markets. So it's a, it's a real challenge. Uh, and obviously there's gonna be a lot of study done uh, after we get control of this pandemic uh, in terms of what we did well and what we need to do a little bit better the next time. Wonderful. And before I move on to, to uh, Secretary Johans, I'd like to just follow up with, um, in terms of the food box program, can you, would you like to say anything about kind of how it it meets um, food sovereignty needs, you know, in terms of people's specific dietary requirements or religious affiliation or, you know, those kinds of things. Is a program like this ever going to um, be a one size fits all approach, uh, you know? Well, when this program was first, first proposed uh, in the context of the SNAP program, I think one of the basic concerns was that how do you create a box that is personalized to a point of being able to respond to uh, a dietetics needs or someone who has uh, other uh, health conditions that require certain types of foods either uh, to be prevented or, or to be increased. And that's the, that's the challenge with the box program is being able to tailor it in a way that responds to the individual needs. I think that's why the SNAP program is, is popular because it does provide you the capacity to go in and make your own choices and to make sure that you're buying the right kinds of food for, for your family. Um, and again, that gets back to making sure that the, we calculate a benefit that is based on real world experience. Just to give you an example, uh, this, this formula su uh, suggests and, and, and assumes that uh, the average American family is spending about an hour to an hour and 15 minutes a day preparing dinner. Well, I don't know. I don't think that's the American family of today. And it's certainly not the American family of today that assumes uh, that you would consume nearly 20 pounds of beans each week. Uh, you know, I'm not sure when that was, but it's certainly not today. Uh, so, so clearly we need to take a look at that formula uh, to make sure that we're adequately providing the kind of nutrition assistance that is necessary during tough times. So Secretary Johans, we have just a couple minutes left, but I'd like to get your thoughts as well on, on nutrition assistance programs and, and their ability to meet the needs in the pandemic. You know, uh, Tom and I worked on the same programs um, when we were Secretary of Agriculture. I do think the SNAP program is going to continue to be the, the leader in terms of meeting those needs. Uh, could not agree more about the WIC program. It always amazed me that uh, we did not get greater participation because it's such a good program and it's an important program. Uh, one other thing I do want to mention, though, uh, and give a shout out to the food banks around the country. Uh, they have done uh, during this pandemic remarkable work, and uh, I, did, I could not sing their praises more. I felt that way uh, when I was Secretary of Agriculture. I feel that way today. Talk about the perfect storm. Uh, here they are. This tremendous demand is headed their way. Because of COVID, they're having a hard time getting the volunteers to do the work, and yet the demand is just exponential. And that was nationwide. It didn't matter if you were in North Dakota or Washington, D.C., or wherever. Uh, that demand just grew because 
uh, people were out of work and a whole host of things were going on. So uh, I want to mention them and, and say uh, whatever we can do to help support them, I think is very, very important, whether it's private or public help. Well, to, unfortunately, to that's point, all the time. Let, Go ahead. To, just two seconds. Uh, one way we can help those folks is by expanding storage capacity and refrigeration capacity so that they're in a position to be able to accept more perishable goods. That would also relieve the need for dumping that we saw early in the pandemic. Mike's absolutely right. Absolutely. Thank you both so much for being here today. And we are going to have a, a brief video uh, coming up and we'll be right back with Lauren Schwader Beal from DC Greens and Paula Daniels at the Center for Good, for Good Food Purchasing. Thanks so much. Welcome back. If you're just joining me, welcome to Washington Post Live. My name is Laura Riley and I am the Business of Food reporter for The Post. Um, for this segment, we are joined by uh, co-founder and executive director of DC Greens, Lauren Schwader Beal, and uh, Paula Daniels, co-founder of the Center for Good Food Purchasing. It's great to have you both with me today. Thanks so much Glad for having us. Yes. So I know neither, you have not met each other at, at any point, but I know your worlds interconnect and I would love to get your your break to break down how your professional lives uh, are, are woven together. Absolutely. Lauren, why don't you start? Sure. So um, DC Greens is really working towards moving systemic change in our food system towards health equity here in the nation's capital in DC. And um, we first intersected with the Good Food Purchasing Program and with Paula's work um, because, you know, so many folks across the country have really admired what they've done out in LA and across the country. And when we first heard about the Good Food Purchasing Program, uh, we worked to bring it to the District of Columbia and uh, get their program embedded into um, DC public schools. So our staffs have worked together for a long time, but it's, it's great to be here together with you, Paula. Yeah, I feel the same. Thank you. It's great to meet you. Uh, live. Um, yeah, our program depends a lot on our relationships with local partners around the country. And we've expanded throughout the country because of these relationships with folks who are working on the ground in communities, in local government and in anchor institutions, and it being a coalition to move the ideas of helping to create um, some sustainability and health and nutrition in our local food system. So DC Greens has been an important partner in that. Thank you, Mark. Wonderful. So first question, I'd love to start with you, Lauren. Um, we've seen that that lifestyle related diseases and our comorbidities are make people more vulnerable to COVID-19. Um, and I know that you've done a lot of work in uh, kind of integrating healthy food into our healthcare system. Can you explain a little bit about the program that you've worked on and, and what needs to happen moving forward kind of on a more national level? Absolutely. Um, so, you know, in DC where we work, um, there's a 17 year life expectancy difference um, between the community of Ward 8, which is um, east of the Anacostia River and is a, a community that has multi generational poverty, 100% um, African American. And uh, the differences between that community and uh, Upper Northwest, which is a wealthier community. So a 17 year life expectancy difference. And uh, four of the five top leading causes of death are diet related chronic illnesses. Um, so what we've been doing is, and when I say diet related chronic illnesses, that's diabetes and things like hypertension, things that we now know to be comor comorbidities for increased mortality um, due to COVID. 
So in DC, um, DC Greens is running a produce prescription program together um, with DC Health Department, with DC Healthcare Finance, with um, some of the Medicaid payers, and with health clinics, where um, basically patients who have uh, diagnoses of diabetes, prediabetes, or hypertension are able to get a prescription that um, gets called into the pharmacy at Giant. That prescription is for uh, fruits and vegetables. It's basically twenty dollars a week for fruits and vegetables. Um, and you know what we found over the years is you know this is food that folks really desperately need. It's really indicated by their doctors, um, and they're able to get the fruits and vegetables because we are embedding it into our healthcare delivery system. And you know we really believe that. Um, Food is medicine, and access to healthy food needs to be integrated into our healthcare system on a broad scale. So, this program is really looking for um, places where we can find a return on investment uh, that show that access to healthy food actually is a cost saver for the healthcare system. Um, you know, impacting things not just individual health metrics, but um, patient utilization of the healthcare system. And you know, what we found during the COVID crisis is health systems across the country were starting to finally see that connection between access to healthy food and public health and the health of their patients. And we had uh, folks reaching out to us from across the country really wanting to figure out how can we um, actually embed healthy food access into our healthcare systems. And the truth is, these are not programs that you can set up in an emergency. But what I'm hopeful for is that we as a society are taking this emergency moment and making real systemic changes um, to our policies, to our uh, our workflows, and to our understanding of the role of healthy food as something that really needs to be systemically embedded into the healthcare system. Um, and not as a charity kind of effort, but actually as core to what it means to deliver healthcare. Wonderful, Lauren. And, and related to that, I, I've heard that there has been a dramatic increase in the use in, in low income people using pandemic EBT or SNAP in farmers markets. Um, is that something you've seen? And is that what are the impediments to having that uh, be embraced nationwide as, a, as an option for people who are food insecure? Um, I'm so sorry. I, my son just walked in. Could you? Is talking about farmers market? Uh, you're talking about farmers market access. I see you doing the hand, the hand no. movement, kid. <laughs> so sorry. Um, yeah. So I, I've heard that at least in the D.C. area that um, there's been an uptick in people using their pandemic EBT and SNAP benefits in farmers markets. And what are the things that that should be done to enable more people in this crisis to use their benefits effectively in that manner? Well, you know, I, I honestly think, you know, the, the first of all, I, I have to commend the PEBT, um, the, the move on the federal level to ensure that PEBT is really accessible. And that's, you know, something that allows for um, school, you know, families of the school aged children to actually receive extra benefits that they would have had um, from the school system. But, you know, I think in DC, and, you know, honestly, the farmer's market landscape is still, I think, struggling with, uh, with technology as a, as a core problem. I mean, you know, the, the actual um, logistics of exchange at a farmer's market, uh, you know, so many people across the country are working to try and, uh, alleviate the burdens that happen to farmers and also just the sort of back-end accounting around this. But, you know, in D.C., we've had really tremendous investment from our local government in farmers market in, uh, incentive programs. And I think that's something that you really need to see across the country, a recognition that um, our cities have at their uh, disposal and our states and our and our nation uh, ways to be able to um, incentivize more people to actually visit farmers markets. But there's, you know, particularly in the pandemic, I have to say, um, it's been complicated because you have to avoid lines and um, some of the processing uh, systems are still not up to par with with where um, I think we all wish that they that they could be. Um, we really need someone, I think, uh, from the the retail side of things to um, 
to help and 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 provide some some technical support across all farmers markets so that you know the uh, the SNAP program can be more easily and more viably accessed um, across farmers markets. Wonderful. And Paula, actually, I was going to ask you as a next question, kind of about the the role of local governments and local institutions, you know, school lunch program programs, et cetera. But also, if you'd like to to add anything to to what Lauren just said, feel free to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, Laura makes some really good points there, but local government and local institutions are, are really key, I think, in addressing um, our food system issues. We definitely saw that during the pandemic and the first few days of shutdown, that it was local governments that had the responsibility of addressing uh, the needs of the community and in delivering um, in ways that they hadn't been used to delivering uh, because it extended beyond the capacity of the food banks. So we had school districts that uh, were heroes and, and stepped up to the charge and pivoted and, and changed how they managed their food service delivery. And most food uh, school districts are the largest food service provider in any region. So they're really anchors of community feeding in ways that we hadn't really taken uh, into account as a society, but definitely became more clear during the pandemic. And the local governments are the ones that had to figure out how to restitch those disrupted supply chains um, which was, uh, as Secretary Vilsack mentioned, a really huge part of our economy. It's a $900 billion food service economy that was shut down. And with that lack of access and folks out of work, it was the local governments that were responding. Our program itself was designed um, from a local government standpoint, actually. So it, it was developed as an initiative of Mayor Villaraigosa of Los Angeles when I worked there um, in his administration as a senior official. And it was intended to uh, use the power of local government's ability to direct the purchasing of public institutions towards supporting those very ideas that Secretary Spilsack and Joanne uh, spoke about recently about supporting the local food economies, um, environmental sustainability in terms of uh, food production in the regional food economy, as well as fair labor and nutritional health. So local governments have a very key role there on the front lines, if you will, of serving community in the food system. And local governments can also help support uh, the expansion of EBT use. Um, and there's other ways that that nutrition system can be more integrated into a holistic food system, um, including having um, more availability of EBT through online grocery purchasing and other methods that local governments can help develop. So Paula, um, do you think that, I, I think that everyone I've spoken to has said being able to use those benefits online has been a godsend, obviously, for social distancing and for people who don't have easy transportation. Um, after whatever the after times are going to be, do you think that uh, those those additional kind of um, leniencies in terms of wh where we get to spend these benefits, do you think those will continue? Do you do you see those being you know drawn back at at the end of the pandemic? Well, I hope they become more permanent fixtures. I think there's um, an opportunity we've used, we've learned from this crisis what the fault lines are on the food system. If they weren't apparent before, they certainly, the system certainly uh, rumbled and broke in some places along the fault lines. So it's an opportunity for us to prepare and come back better in the way that we do better structural engineering after an earthquake and realize how weak our buildings were and now we've got better uh, systems for shoring up our buildings in those times. Um, this is an opportunity for us to take the lessons learned and build it into our system. And one of the things that, as, as Lauren said and, and can speak to uh, even better than me, is that uh, food as medicine is needs to be integrated into the system. And it's so that it's not only about delivering calories, it's uh, primarily and foremost about delivering nutrition so that um, healthy foods are, are more available. And that also ties it into the local farming economy that as you saw was significantly impacted during this, this time as local governments shifted to try to um, make sure that um, calories were delivered, that food was delivered, um, their ability to, to sweep in also the, um, the local food economy and the farmers that had excess food, but their supply chains were disrupted. So that needs to be managed as well. In the, in the cases we saw in the cases where there were strong relationships with local government and with the community-based um, civil society organizations that were already working in developing those relationships with the local farming economy and with uh, historically food insecure populations that they were able to tap into 
um, those existing relationships and pivot more quickly and nimbly into addressing all of those all of those areas. Wonderful. I mean, I actually, that was kind of one of my next questions was just the, the, the huge disconnect between where food is and where food needs to be. Obviously, you know, local food systems are a way of, of uh, shoring up some of those kind of bottlenecks or, or supply chain disruptions. So Lauren, what, what are some of the strategies that, that you know, municipalities or uh, regions should adopt to have more of that resiliency and, and, and focus more a little on the, the local food system? Absolutely. I mean, and I, I really love um, Paula's um, discussion of, of partnerships being so key to this because I, I do think that, you know, in many ways, our our city governments and our, our, our federal governments sort of um, have pushed a lot of responsibility for our emergency food system onto the nonprofit sector um, about 40 years ago. And I think, you know, we're in a moment where there's sort of a collective recognition that the, you know, uh, depending on a, a sort of a food bank system um, without sufficient um, support from our governments, really, you know, there's so many fractures that that happened in that system, um, you know, reliance on volunteers, the, uh, the way that those um, systems tend to be set up on sort of congregant feeding or, um, you know, folks having to come to a place to get a thing. And I, I think what was very striking to me was, um, how that last mile piece is really something I, I don't think that we've entirely worked out as a as a certainly not in DC and 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 across the country. It's it's something that I think we've all struggled with, you know. I and I I do think that um, what you've seen in this period is the sort of emergence of mutual aid groups and um, communities really. Uh, figuring out solutions uh, within their own community to help each other, um, which really is a, a, you know, harkens to ideas of, of food sovereignty, of, of communities sort of um, being forced to figure out uh, how, to, how to feed themselves. And, you know, truly, I think this moment can be an opportunity for our cities and our, our governments to really lift up the solution sets that we've seen coming out of communities. Um, you know, so we were talking about uh, school food. I mean, when you look at the history of out of the um, Black Panther movies, you know, with the Black Panthers really Oh, we're, we're cracking up a little bit here. A little bit. Good. Paula, please. The food system. So, you know, I, I think it's very important oh. for, um, am I breaking up? <laughs> You're breaking up a little bit. So you might rewind a little bit. Tell us what you, give us your last couple sentences, just so we can all be on the same Oh. The saying is that, can you hear me now? Yes. What I was saying is that, you know, when we look at our school food system, it really, the history of it really comes from the Black Panther movement and the, you know, the efforts of community to feed themselves and was lifted up and adopted into our school food program, our, our school breakfast program. Um, but I think we have this opportunity as we look to the future to really think about, you know, what would it be to lift up community-led solutions um, not in a way that sort of appropriates them and um, institutionalizes them, but actually that uses the um, the strength of government, really its power to write big checks <laughs> and uh, make sure that that is uh, going to support these um, expressions of food sovereignty that we've seen really rise up in this time. And, and, and you know, that have honestly been um, necessities in communities of color forever um, because of uh, various policies that have, have made it impossible or, or very difficult for uh, communities to access um, the sort of standard food production systems and supply chains. So so this is, a, I'd like to ask Paula this, so the, you've kind of just described these, these tensions. So we have on the one hand, you, know, you have a food box, the last mile is the issue. So you have these food box programs. I mean, President Trump suggested those food boxes and there was a hue and cry about it um, because it's so antithetical to food sovereignty and, and respecting people's, um, you know, 
food traditions and that kind of thing. So how do you square that in an emergency or even kind of moving forward that the are each of us as unique individuals who like and eat and believe in certain kinds of dietary um, allegiances and the, the need to feed everybody in, a, in a, an expedient way? Mm -hmm. Well, I think there's a lot of elements to what can make uh, for a healthy food system. And I, they, the point made earlier um, by the secretaries about resilience is key, but another point I want to add in here is diversity. Because um, what we need to have is diversity of food production methods, diversity of distribution methods, diversity um, in, in a sense of, let me analogize it to our energy system. So in the you know 20th century, we became very dependent on one form of energy, which was oil production. In the 21st century, uh, we've become uh, recognizing that we need to build up more of a renewable portfolio in all of our energy programs and most local governments states um, and municipalities have developed goals for renewable energy that show a diversity of energy production. What is How does this relate to the food system? We currently have a very globalized uh, export-based food system. In most places, about 10% of the food is local. If you were to increase that to a place where you have um, a meaningful percentage of local that can support the local food economy, um, then you have a diversity of producers. So you have different ranges of producers from large to small, but more economic opportunity for the smaller and mid-sized farmers. If you increase that um, a target and set a target as a local government, aggregating the purchasing power of your large institutions and saying, we all agree we're going to support our local food economies, create jobs along the supply chain in our local food economies, and bring different types of food production to the plates of our uh, community, which would include the protective foods, the healthy foods, the, the produce that matters to them. You have uh, local governments that can direct that, but they can also um, take into account local means of production. So they, uh, a program could be developed uh, from local government as, as we did in Los Angeles, that you're also supporting urban agriculture. So um, like you know, in the uh, World War two era, my grandparents had victory gardens, and that certainly seems to be coming back during the time of COVID. So layering in all those methods of production, but an important thing also is um, the methods of distribution. So one of the things we saw was a supply chain disruption dependent on very opaque supply chains um, that were hardwired into the system. If you have a dedicated form of uh, distribution of food that serves local, is dedicated to serving the local farming community as well as uh, food insecure populations and public serving institutions such as school districts uh, that can create some more diversity and, and mission into the supply chain that will help in times of crisis. There was one uh, like that that did quite well during the pandemic. It's called the Common Market that was started in Philadelphia. It's a nonprofit and um, it also has um, facilities in Georgia and uh, Chicago and Texas. So it was able to support the local farming economy as well as serve schools and food banks mm -hmm. with that healthier food. So it's that diversity of um, including, as the secretary said, local processing that we need to build into the system so it has that resilience and redundancy. And local governments are the places where that can be imagined and led and developed. They have economic development um, branches, they have workforce investment boards, all of those um, aspects of local government can be invoked and can participate in realigning our food system with these public values. Wonderful. So we have just a couple minutes left and I, I'd like to get an audience question in here. Um, this comes from Elizabeth Kelly in Missouri. What is the number one thing we should be encouraging our families, friends, and neighbors to do to contribute to a more sustainable food system? And Lauren, I think I'd like to start with you on this. Hmm. Well, you know, I honestly think that a sustainable food system really starts with policy. Um, and I think what matters the most in building a sustainable food system is that we um, 
start to move our thinking away from the kind of a charity system that we've had and recognize that access to healthy food really is a basic human right and needs to be baked into our system. Um, and that means that, you know, there was sort of an aha moment a, a century ago when there was a connection made between um, cholera and clean water. And people started to realize that water really was a public health issue. Um, and I think we're in that cholera moment now for food where we need to recognize that policies have to be put in place where, um, you know, folks are able to get access to healthy food as a basic human right. And that means uh, tax incentives for grocery stores. It means, um, it means investment in school food. It means waivers for Medicaid so that folks can get um, access to healthy food in their in, in through their medical system for their healthcare system. And I also think it means um, pushing for changes to our granting systems on the government level so that more community leaders and smaller organizations are actually able to access that are necessary to create a sustainable food system in their own communities. Wonderful. And and Paula, 20 seconds, I'd love for you to kind of guide us out here. What do you have to add to that? Participate in the governance of food and hold uh, local, state, and federal officials accountable. There's uh, elections going on right now. These are questions that can be asked. Um, there was a mayor's debate in Honolulu that was focused entirely on the food and agriculture system of Oahu. Um, this, this has happened in Chicago as well um, in mayoral debates. So ask your local elected officials what they, how they intend to participate in this important uh, issue. And then uh, ask for transparency and participate in school board meetings. Um, find out how the school board is um, and, the, and the schools are directing their purchases and make those choices yourself. Wonderful. Well, Lauren and Paula, thank you both so much for being here today. This has been wonderful. Thank, thank you. you. It's been a pleasure. All right, and, and thank you all for joining us at 2 p.m. this afternoon during Washington Post Live for an interview with the director of the National Gallery of Art, Kaywin Feldman, as part of our Race in America series. Uh, and tomorrow, a continuation of the Voting Matters series featuring former Massachusetts Governor, Governor Deval Patrick and uh, Zach Carruthers, who is in the band Portugal the Man, and Amy Lee of Effinescence. Um, and as always, you can head to WashingtonPostLive.com to register for upcoming events. Thanks so much.